I study public arts in a broad sense, be it illustration, public monuments, urban design forms of various sorts, murals and things like that. So I'm interested in the material culture of the public sphere as it intersects with art endeavors, but not just art endeavors of a kind of isolated sort that include commercial art, for example. Uh, I'm very interested in illustration, advertising art and practice, as well as illustration for print magazines and record covered albums and things like that. I mean, what really gets me going initially is the, is the advertisements themselves, so the, the actual print ads, and usually the ones that strike me as being hilarious, because from a present day perspective, you look back at some of the earlier advertisements and they're weird, uh, or they're very funny in some way or another. There are certain kinds of advertisements especially from the 1920s, for example, that are just really beautifully rendered. And so it's very exciting to look at how an artist was working to appeal and attract people to products based on their, their handiwork. I'm very interested in how advertisements actually worked to try to stimulate desire, you know, the connection between desire, evoking desire for a product and, and evoking desire, so the sort of psychological dimensions of the aesthetic work. I basically have become interested in how public sculpture and illustration both are and have been dismissed. So on some level, although the two of them are very much in the public sphere and the public realm and very visible, they're also controversial and on some level culturally marginal, at least as far as academic endeavors are concerned. And so I got interested in the reasons for that happening and parallels or divergences as it were. So for example, both illustration and public sculpture of a figurative sort, so earlier public monuments dating from, say, 1900 to the 1950s, which all rely on the figure and more traditional artistic aesthetic forms, have also encountered a lot of um, resistance amongst certain kinds of scholars because they don't measure up aesthetically to what people consider to be good art. So people bring their expectations of a certain kind of definition of art to illustration or to public sculpture and using those standards uh, of taste Illustration and sculpture don't measure up. It's taken a very long time to try to position illustration and public art, public sculpture on the map as far as just even people looking at them, doing research on them and taking them seriously. Uh, in order to take them seriously, you can't apply the same standards as you would apply to choosing to study a, a painting or a sculpture that would go into a gallery. I found no sooner did I find ways of doing that, of uh, examining illustration and monuments as processes, um, the culmination of practices, as opposed to looking at them as aesthetic objects. Both, in some ways, came under, have come under fire recently for different kinds of reasons. The problem of people now dismissing the two of these kinds of endeavors because of their, the nature of some of their imagery. So people taking offense at the, the racial dimensions of a lot of this stuff or the, the gender biases that are inherent in a lot of these images. Just as 
monuments, Confederate monuments, have come under fire, are being torn down because of the racist and su white supremacist attitudes that are embodied in those works or that are part of what they mean and a good part of what they mean. Similarly, with certain kinds of illustration and advertisements, uh, those advertisements, certain campaigns relied on imagery that people would now a days find offensive. What I have been trying to show, what I discuss in my blog briefly, is the fact that that certainly is part of their meaning, but it is, if you think of it in a larger sense, that is not all they mean. And so to try to sweep this kind of imagery under the rug and it, pretend that it doesn't exist or just try to get rid of it, actively suppress it, is historically, from my perspective, very problematic because there's this whole other aspect of their meaning that tells us a good deal about American life, about individual people, about individual biographies, about work practices, about all sorts of things that go into the making of these objects that are, in my view, as important as the racial offensiveness. It kind of depends on where you're starting from. And if you're starting from the idea that race has to be the point of departure and that you judge everything according to whether it is um, measures up to our standards of racial equity, then invariably a whole class of images uh, is going to be unacceptable. So people have taken that stand and are tearing them down or, or removing them from view or don't want, people don't want to examine them. So if you take something like the cream of wheat advertisements from the early 20th century, those are problematic from a racial standpoint. But I'm interested in those kinds of images for different kinds of reasons, and I have attempted to argue that those reasons are worth studying and worth uh, examining in depth for what they show us about American life in other ways. So that's really what I am trying to point to in my blog post and, and hope to continue to examine.